Good morning. Today we continue our summer message series called Game Changers. And we're looking at Paul's letter to the Corinthians and how he would use different sports analogies or ideas to help that church recognize spiritual truths. This message, is a, uh, this message series is a fun way that we are using to accompany the Olympic Games coming up this Friday. So the Olympic Games are officially here this Friday. Now, to get this message going, I'm going to have my son come on up here real fast. Come on up. My other son. We're doing all the kids today. That was a weak hello and, like, greeting. There we go. So have you ever watched a relay race before? Anybody? Okay, thank you. Okay, so they have the baton, right, and they have to pass it off to the next member on their team as they run around on the track. We have seen that. So I did that event in high school, and we had to work really, really hard to get that exchange of the baton working flawlessly. Has anybody ever tried to pass on a baton before? Has anybody ever been in a relay race? Is it easy? No, No, it is not. Even at the Olympic level, you see these poor athletes mess up this exchange. So me and Soli are going to demonstrate today what that looks like. We have our couple things we're going to do first. We worked on it at our first service. It went, we, we nailed it. We nailed it. It went okay. So hopefully this one's a little better. We got this, Soli? Okay. Go over there. So I'm going to show you one of the first mistakes that happens when you run a relay with a partner and the exchange. What happens is this guy is running as fast as he can, and I see him start running towards me. I start running as fast as I can while looking behind me. I'm like, okay, here comes the baton. I start running too fast. Guess what happens? I'm outside the box, and we didn't actually get the exchange to happen. We're disqualified. That's the first mistake that happens. That one doesn't happen that often. This next one we're going to demonstrate happens all the time at the Olympic level, too. This one happens where Soli will be running, and I'm running, but I'm not going fast enough, and then boom, we just fall, and again, disqualified. The way it's supposed to go is this flawless effort that everything looks like one and we just pass it on to each other and we don't even really stop. We got this? Okay. So, Sol, you're going to start running. I'm going to start running. I'm looking back. My hand's out. Boom. Bam. That was good, boy. Let's give him a round of applause. So you can't accelerate too quickly or you're going to leave the passing zone. You can't go too slow or they're going to run right into you. But when you do it together, there is this oneness that creates this beautiful exchange of this relay team. And that's not the only relay teams there are, of course. We know if we watch the Olympics, you're going to see the water relays. We're going to see diving teams and wrestling teams and gymnastic teams all working together as one to accomplish the same goal. Now, this is a great illustration for working well together as a church. Working together as what Christ, what, what, what Christ is called the body of Christ. Okay, now Paul calls this the body of Christ, and today we're talking about unity. Now, I enjoy talking about unity, but when you do messages like this, things happen. People seem to get a little uncomfortable because they love the idea of it, but putting it into practice is a whole different ball game. Now, what happens a lot of times is we look at the church, we look at any social situation, and we start feeling insecure, like we're not good enough to be part of that team, or we're not talented enough, or we're not spiritual enough, or we're not good enough to really make a difference. And in church, unfortunately, sometimes this gets magnified to a whole other level. When you look at somebody and you see, wow, they seem to be so spiritual. They're so incredible. They can quote scriptures just from memory. I can't do that. You listen to some people that pray and you're like, whoa, I bet God is even saying that was a good prayer. 
All right? Like, that was so good. They had the prayer warriors. And your prayer is like, rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. Now, you might buy into the lie that when it comes to church that if I weren't doing this little role I have or if I wasn't here, it wouldn't make that big of a difference. Jesus told this parable about a shepherd that had a a hundred sheep. But one of the sheep, he wandered away. Now, the shepherd loved so much that sheep that he left the 99 to go get that one sheep. That one sheep was so valuable to that shepherd, so valuable, that shepherd knew that he had to get that sheep back into the fold. Now let me explain something to you. I have two children. You guys saw them today. One was doing announcements and the other was doing a demonstration. If one of my children went astray and got lost, I promise you I wouldn't be saying, Oh, where's Ben? I can't find Ben. Oh, well, we got one more. We're okay. We got the one kid. Who cares, right? I would never, ever do that because all of my children are uniquely valuable to my heart. We have family movie night, usually about once a week. If one of the kids isn't there, it feels incomplete. Even if one of my dumb dogs isn't in the room with us, it feels incomplete. We got the kiddos, we got the dogs, we got fish. If one person's not there, the team feels incomplete. Now, all of us here are involved in this thing called life. And all of us here are part of some sort of team. If you like it or not, whether you like it or not, you're part of something. Now, I need you to hear this. You are valuable to God. You heard that, right? You are valuable to God. You are uniquely created by God. You are uniquely valuable to God because you are a child of God. And I know you hear pastors saying that stuff all the time, but it's going to set up this whole message because you're not just valuable because of who you are. You're also valuable because you are created for a purpose. You need to know that. You are created to make a difference in God's church. If you're here today, you can make a difference. And my prayer is is that you will see how much value you have in God's work. You are uniquely prepared with divine gifts and talents and passions. And when God created you, he put you here at this moment right now, at this time, because you could best glorify God right now. God's church needs you. So what I want to show you today is a metaphor from the Apostle Paul. And what he does is he compares the church, God's people, to a human body. And what's happening in in that church at that time, there's division. There's people fighting for positions. It's, It's dysfunctional and not healthy. So Paul is trying to show them how to come together as one, have unity. So here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 through 19. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? So the first thing I want you to see from this text is we need to recognize variety. Variety is important. God loves variety. It's almost as if Paul is writing to this church. He can sense the reality that some of us may be feeling today that I'm not that important. If I wasn't here today it wouldn't really make a difference. You're wrong. You're wrong. 
Look at every single one of us here. We all have even different thumbnail, uh, sorry, thumbprints. Each and every single one of us have different thumbprints. We all have different thumbnails too. I guess that was all right to say that. On my phone, there's facial recognition. Anybody have that on their phone? Where you have to put it up to your face and it has to show you, and if you have glasses on, sometimes it doesn't work. That's how unique our faces are, that if someone tried to go in my phone in my backpack right now and turn it on, they couldn't because it has that facial recognition. That's how uniquely we are made. So we have to recognize that God loves variety. Every single one of us, we all look different. And he brought us all together into church, even like today, with very different gifts and very different operations and different styles and and even different styles of ministry in this world. Aren't you so glad there's not just one style of ministry? I am. I am so glad that there are different expressions of the Lord in every community around the world. And man, I get so jealous when I see Southern Baptist preachers and they get to like sing preach. Does anybody know what I'm talking about with sing preaching? They got the organ, right? It builds in the background. Where's Dean at? Come on. Like the Lord is my shepherd. Like why don't I get to do that? One Sunday, it's coming, everybody. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. But God loves variety. You think our church is set up the same way as a church in Africa? The same way as a church in, in Asia that, that's worshiping the same Lord? Difference. Variety. It's, it's beautiful. You can just look around at creation. I'm so glad the world doesn't just look like Corona. I'm so glad the world doesn't just look like Fontana. I'm serious, I'm so glad the world doesn't just look like Hawaii even. It's nice to be able to drive one direction and go to the beach, the other direction and go to the mountains, the other direction and go to the desert. It, it's a beautiful thing. So now let's get back to our, our body and all the different parts like Paul brings up here. I'm going to read 14 through 19 one more time. Even so, the body is not made up of one part but of many. Now if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? Paul's crazy. Some of the stuff you think about that, the whole body was an eye. What's happening here, Paul? I love this stuff. Then he says, if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be, just as God wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? So the body of Christ, it malfunctions when we emphasize one gift over another. The body of Christ malfunctions when we emphasize one person over another. When we put a certain person on a pedestal, it's not good for that person, and it's not good for the rest of us. Not according to Paul. Paul is saying all parts of the body are necessary and important. And so what he does, like I was mentioning I love so much, is he compares two parts of the body that are rarely seen or talked about to two parts of the body that are always seen and always pretty much talked about. You know, he says that we have the eye and the hand. These are always seen. These are always being used to parts that are not regularly talked about or, or seen, the foot and the ear. But both are important. Because what would happen if one day my foot started talking, imagine, go with me, and my foot says, I am tired of this stuff. I am tired of being down here, down low. I want some more visibility. I want the limelight. This place is always dark and sweaty and smelly. Why can't I be up high on top of the head maybe? Then you would have a toe on your forehead. And all of us will be named Tony. <laughs> Goodness gracious. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's hard. I, I take you right out of spiritual things as soon as I start doing dad jokes. I'm sorry. However, hands are visible. You reach out to grab someone's hand to shake their hand, right? We did that today in our meet and greet time. You don't shake with your feet. I don't think I see people do that very often. You don't walk around on your hands. You 
do, maybe some people do for a little bit, but you don't get very far. Think about how much attention the eye gets. The eye gets all the attention. No one ever has an ear-to-ear conversation. Love at first hearing. It doesn't, it's not a thing. Beauty is in the ear of the beholder. I can keep going. You're the apple of my ear. It doesn't work. The ear could so easily think, I'm not important. Why, why am I even on this body? No one talks about me, thinks about me. Let me ask you, did anybody think about their ear today? I know there's one person in this room that thought about his ear today. It's my dad. He has a cochlear implant. Those, those are a miracle device that helps people that can't hear to hear. You can watch on videos of, of kids putting these on for the first time and hearing their parents speak for the first It's beautiful. Like chokes me up. That's how important the ear is. But there are so many parts of the body that are vital and important and necessary that we really don't think about all the time until it malfunctions, right? Until something happens. Then you really start thinking about that. So it is in the church. If there's a malfunction, all that focus, all that attention is going to be focused now on that one member that's creating difficulty. And you have to address it. You have to attend to it. And you have to get that thing fixed. So far with our physical bodies, you have to go through radiation or physical therapy or surgery, whatever it takes to address the issue. The stuff you normally don't have to think about, like your ears or your, or your pancreas, you need them. They're, they're working. They're doing things. They're just automatically functioning and, and, and doing their job, but we don't think about them. But guess what? They are very, very important. Very important. Every part of the body matters. Every part. Now get this. Your part, your voice, your opinion, your contribution, it all means something in the family of God. Every single one of us. I'm going to keep hitting that point because I think sometimes we forget that you do matter. And if you're sitting in this room right now, you matter. So let's get to the next thing. The next thing I want you to see from these scriptures is this. Emphasize unity. We have to be united. We have to emphasize unity in the body of Christ. I'm reading 20 through 27 now. As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving, it, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Those that other people overlook or don't get any airtime or aren't on the stage or most visible can often be the most important parts of the body. Because listen, all of us together, all of you, all of you together are Christ's body, and each of you have that part. Everyone matters. It says those parts of the body that seem weaker or indispensable. See, no one says, hey, God, could I be the armpit hair on this body? Like, please, I want to be the smelly part of the body. Even armpit hair is important. It is. It diffuses odor to make you more naturally attractive to a potential mate. There's a reason for it. Your part in the body matters, and I hope you understand that. Just because it's not as maybe visible does not mean it's not important. The lung isn't visible, is it? But thank God the lung isn't visible. If your lung was like, I want to be seen. If I'm not working, you're not working. Listen, lung, you are so important. We don't want you out there with the grossness of the world. We want you inside of here. We want you tucked in and protected. 
Just because people don't see it or don't know about it doesn't mean that it doesn't matter to God. It does matter to God. You may be the invisible prayer warrior. You may be going home every single day, every morning, afternoon, and night. You are just praying and praying and praying for your family and your friends and the church and the community and the world. And you may spend tons of time seeking God and nobody knows, not one person. But week after week, lives are being changed. Week after week, people are saying yes to the grace of God, all because of your private faith, what you did behind the scenes. You may do something to help someone feel loved just by smiling at them, making them feel needed, picking up a piece of trash. It may not be incredibly visible, but just because it's not visible does not mean it's important, okay? It is important. So often, some of the most important things that are happening are the least celebrated because we might not see it. And what Paul is saying right here is, that doesn't matter. You are important to this body of Christ. And he says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. Absolutely. Think about our physical body. Has anybody used a hammer before? And you're trying to hit the nail on the head, right? And you miss and you hit your thumb. Has anybody done that before? If you've ever done that before, I promise you, you did not say, ow, my thumb hurts. No, your whole body is cringing. You're like rolling over, thinking you're going to die because you only hit your thumb. Same if you stub your toe. You stub your toe, are you thinking, oh, darn, darn, my toe hurts. That's it. Your whole body is just falling down in pain. If one part suffers, every part suffers. So in the church if one member suffers, all the members start suffering. We are only as healthy as the health of each member together. Have you ever laid on your arm the wrong way and it fell asleep? Does anybody know that feeling? You know, it's just like all of a sudden it's like numb and kind of tingly and your arm is falling asleep. And when that happens, it's essentially like paralyzed. You're trying to move it. It's, it's dormant. It's useless. Can I just say that you're part of the body of Christ, and if you're not using your gifts that God has given you, you've gone to sleep. You have fallen asleep. That part of the body is now useless. You're not living out your divine calling. You're not living out your function. You're not living out your role, your part, your position. You're not living it out because you've gone to sleep. If that is you, wake up. It's time to wake up. You are a valuable part. Something that God wants to be done isn't being done because you have fallen asleep. Something that God wants to reach out and, and bring into the fold is not happening because you've fallen asleep. Someone that God wants to hear the, the gospel, but you're not sharing the gospel because you've fallen asleep. Wake up, church. Wake up, church. Church is not just a building that we go to. It's not just an institution that we're part of. We are the living body of Christ. We are the church. We don't go to church to meet our needs. I need to say that again. We don't go to church to meet our needs. I know so often now in Western churches, we think we have to go to meet our needs. That is not why we go to church. We go to meet the needs of others all over this community and world. That's what the church is. That's what we do. That's who we are. That's a Christian church. And what do you think would happen if every part of the body was engaged, not asleep, ready to go in ministry? What do you think would happen? What difference do you think could happen in communities if we all saw our role as important and significant? I'll tell you just within our church, you put a few people together, a few people brought some, their treasures, their money together, and we were able to collect over $3,000 for our Summer Blast VBS this year. We promoted that for, I think, about a month, and we all got together and said, let's do this. Let's, let's, let's make sure these kids are getting the best Jesus experience that they can get. We want to show them that love. Last year, what happens when we bring a few people together? for Thanksgiving to help support families in need. We fed over 78 families. Do you get that? We are not a mega church, and yet we're feeding over 78 families for Thanksgiving. A few people together can create this whole experience that you see today to go get the supplies, to decorate this place, to make sure everything is running perfectly. We even work with another church to help this, make this happen. 
That's what happens when we get a few people together, a few people, the body of Christ. A few people together could have kids come in here and say, I want to accept Christ. A few people together could show these kids what it means to be baptized. That's the beauty of the body of Christ. Think what is possible if you would just recognize that you matter to God, that you sitting in this chair right now, it matters. Your gifts and your talents. You're his hands, you're his feet, you're his elbow, you're his armpit hair. I don't care what you are. You are important. So I want to play this little game as we close here today. I'm going to show a few photos of some animals. You guys tell me what animal it is, and then we'll talk about it. So let's get to this first one right now. What is that elephant? <laughs> what is this animal? It is an elephant. This is an elephant. What do you call a group of elephants? A herd, correct. Next one. What is this animal? It is not an elephant, it's a lion. Now what do you call a group of lions together? A pride, that's right, it's called a pride of lions. Next one. We got some what here? Cheetahs. What do you call a group of cheetahs together? Cheez-Its, Cheetos. No. A cat. Did you say a cat? A pack? No, close. It's actually called a coalition. That's fun, right? I kind of like that one. A coalition of cheetahs. Next one. What, that's a donkey. What do you call a group of donkeys? Be careful, church. Be careful. What do you call a group of donkeys? A pace. A pace of donkeys. Yeah. I'm telling you, pace. Next animal, what do we got there? A crow. What do you call a group of, a murder of crows. That's, that's brutal. Okay, next one. Wolves. Yep, a pack. You call a group of these guys a pack. Last one. What? Vultures. What do you call a group of vultures? A committee. They're like a church. Always putting committees together. The vultures, man. No more committees. No more committees. So keep that picture up just for a second for me real fast, Chelsea. All right. So one of these animals has an identity, right? That's just a vulture. But you put them together and it creates a new identity. I want I want you to have that sink in. One animal on its own is called a donkey, right? A horse, a vulture. But together, it's called a pace or a pack or a herd or a committee. What do you call a person that's given their life to Jesus Christ, that has surrendered their life to Jesus? What do you call that person? A Christian, absolutely. You might call that person a disciple, you might call them a follower of Christ, whatever. What then do you call a group of Christians gathered together to worship God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to make a difference in this world? What do you call them? You call that group a church, don't you? Paul calls it the body of Christ. Makes it a little bit more powerful, doesn't it? We are the body of Christ in this room right now. On your own, you're a disciple. Beautiful. But when you gather together with other Christians, you take on a whole new identity. Whole new identity. You are his body. Every one of us. You are his hands to go serve people in his name. You are his feet to go take the message of the gospel into places maybe it's never been before. You are his mouth when you lift others up and encourage others through love. You are his heart when you express his love to other people. You are a valuable part of the body of Christ. And any time the enemy tells you you're not important, you're not good enough, you got to come back and say, no, my God created me. He sent his son for me. His spirit dwells within me. I am a valuable part of the body of Christ. 
And what I hope you understand and you embrace is that every part of the body matters. Every time you give, your gift matters. Every time you pray and you feel like nothing's happening, it is. Every time you worship with others, you maybe didn't want to come to church today, it matters to the heart of God. It matters. You have no idea how much Nicole and I appreciate every single one of you. Every single one of you. You have no idea how much we appreciate watching people come yesterday to, to set all this up. You have no idea how much we appreciate when we have people pray over us and pray over our lives, even if we don't know it. You have no idea how much it means to me when you send that text of encouragement. I let that text sink in for the rest of that day. I, I meditate on that knowing that I, I'm glorifying God. I'm glorifying God. When I first started to have a relationship with Christ, I started without church. And I kept reading the scriptures, and I saw that Jesus was always going in the church synagogues. He was always going in the church, and I thought, I, I got to try this. I got to get into a church, see what it's like. I got to leave all my preconceived notions at the door of what church is. I just got to walk in. And the first church I walked into, I was a fly on the wall. I didn't even want people to really say hi to me. I'm like, let me just like walk by you and just go sit down. No one talked to me. I just want to be there. And I kept going. And something was happening within me. And I learned that when I came together with other believers and we came together to worship Jesus, something happened in that room every single time. There was prayers being prayed over people. There were songs being sung. I could sit there and, and hear the word of God spoken. And, and I, I realized I was missing an element when I was out on my own. I was a lone wolf, but I needed my pack. And then Nicole and I experienced something I never imagined, fellowship. I never thought I was going to be a Christian. I needed fellowship. And then I realized I did need fellowship. I did need Jesus' love through his people. I, I did need those strangers that I don't even really know that well praying for me. And if you're sitting there thinking, that's good for you, you're a pastor. I wasn't. I was a fly on the wall. I was the one that didn't want to say hi to anybody when I walked in and walked out. But that person could be sitting here right now. That person could be sitting on his computer or TV watching online. And if you're sitting there with church hurt or confusion, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry that you've had that hurt. I'm sorry you have that confusion. I, I truly am. But God, God is good. God is good. And you will see if you just keep doing it. Keep going, you're going to see that you are valuable in this body of Christ, that you are needed in this body of Christ. And what ends up happening, you will be blessed by others. You will be loved on by others. And everything inside of you will change. You will transform. You will transform from the inside out because of what Jesus Christ can do. And I'm telling you, when we live that out, when we're living that kind of faith, helping others come to Christ, the community around us is going to look at the Bridge Church and they're going to say, oh, our city is different because of that church. Our city's different. Our community is different because of that church. That church is actually meeting needs. That church is actually showing God's love. That church, oh man, that is the body of Christ. I see it. I feel it. Don't you want that? If you are new here or you're watching online for the first time because you're bringing your kids to VBS this week, that's the vision of our church. I just want to make sure you know that. Our vision is to be with Jesus, to become more like him and learn from him and do as he did. That's our goal. That's the life that we want to live. God is good. Amen. All the time. Let's stand in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together as a church group, to come together as the body of Christ and worship you. Thank you for this opportunity to love on each other. Thank you for this opportunity to encourage each other. Thank you for this opportunity to serve one another. Lord, I pray for that person that's either online right now or sitting in this room right now that just wants to be a fly on the wall. Lord, I'm, I, I, I feel so blessed that their presence is here in this room or online. I feel so blessed by it. The whole church should that they are sitting there trying to figure out what a relationship with Jesus looks like. But what I pray is that you move in them. I pray that you transform that, that all of a sudden they say, I, I, I want to know what this is all about. 
I want to know what fellowship is. I want to know what Jesus' love is through other people. I want to know brotherly love. I want to know what it's like to be able to call someone my brother and sister in Christ. That's what I'm praying for. Lord, I, I pray that if, if they don't know you, that they know you. Amen. That they knock and you will open that door. They soften their hearts. And they will see the goodness in you. They will see the kindness in you. And the patience in you. And the love in you. And the encouragement in you. I pray that we can be that church. That when people look in, they say, they are making a difference. I pray we can be that church when people look in, they can say, they are spreading Jesus' love. They are a light to the community. And I pray for anyone in this room right now, because this is on my heart. That, Lord, I pray they know that they are loved. I pray they know that they are valuable. I pray they know they have meaning and purpose for this life right now at this time. That's what I pray they know. In Jesus Christ's name, we all pray. Amen. I'm going to call the praise band up. But what I want everyone to do right now is to grab a chair. Grab a couple chairs. Just, just, hold, just touch them. Hold them. Because we're going to pray over our VBS. We're going to pray over the kids that are going to be sitting, sitting in these chairs right now. Sorry, this, this coming week. And I just want to pray that God moves. And we're able to do something incredible through this time together with our games and the beach theme. These aren't Christmas trees. This is like Central Coast. Okay, everybody, I keep hearing that. So everyone grab a chair in front of you, around you, lay on it. I don't care. Let's just get these chairs prayed over. Heavenly Father, we come right now to, to pray over our Summer Blast VBS. We pray that the kids that sit in these chairs know that they are loved. We pray that maybe one of these kids might accept you into their hearts. We pray that maybe if, if, if we just can plant a seed of faith, that it changes them for the rest of their life. We pray that even maybe there's a, there's a kid out here that's going to be a future pastor. We pray that there's a kid out here that's going to be a future kids, kids bridge director. We pray out there may be a kid in here that's going to be a future worship director. We pray there might be some kid in here that's going to defend the faith for us. And he's going to be an apologetic person where he's going to tell people why we live out this life of Christ. That's what we're praying for right now. Lord, I, I pray that maybe even a kid will say, I, I want to be baptized. I learned from VBS what this means. I want to be baptized. That's what I'm praying for. I'm praying for a change in each of these children's life. I'm also praying for every single volunteer in here, for every teacher in here that's going to be teaching. I'm praying over Kristen and Karina and Nicole for leading this effort. And I just, I pray that the people of our church continue to pray this week as the kids come in. Continue to pray every single day for these children. In Jesus Christ's name, we all pray, amen. Right now, we're going to be passing out our tithing baskets. Thank you for being so generous here to the Bridge Church. We have our prayer team ready to go. They have lanyards on if you need prayer, if you've accepted Christ today, or you just need someone to pray over you. We have them ready to go. God bless. Have a great rest of your week, and, and check out our pictures online of all the kids having fun this week. The splendor of the King, hold in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. Trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice. How great.
guys so much for coming. Have a great week, and let's go watch some kids lose at cornhole. <laughs> <laughs>